Great to see you. Great to be able to share the word of the Lord with you this morning. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to come over with me to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. And uh, Pastor Glenn, I just want to say that was not red wine. That was Diet Coke in that slide. <laughs> but uh, amen. Guys, I hope we'll come out for that on Tuesday night. John chapter 13 in your Bibles, or you can just follow along words, uh, follow the words on the screen with me. I'm going to begin reading at verse 1. The Bible says, Now before the feast of the Passover... When Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes, so that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. That was John, by the way, we find out later on. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought that because Judas had the money box, that Jesus had said to him, Buy those things we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately, and it was night. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And we'll finish in verse 35. It says, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I want to share with you this morning on this topic, learning how Jesus loves. Learning how Jesus loves. Let's pray and let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and minister as we look into the Word of God today. Father, we come to you this morning in the beautiful name of Jesus and 
We thank you together, Lord, for the gift of your word. It's the lamp for our feet, and it's the light for our pathway. Jesus said that the word of God is like seed. So, Father, across these next few minutes, we give you our hearts. We ask that you would touch our hearts by your spirit. God, let our hearts right now become good soil that can receive the seed and hold on to the seed and bear fruit from the seed of the word of God. If you agree with that, would you say amen? Amen. amen. Well, over the last few weeks, we've been exploring the Passion Week, the last six days in Jesus' life leading up to his death and his resurrection on Easter. Jesus' life was the most important life that has ever been lived, and the Passion Week was the most significant week of his life. God highlights for us the importance of that week by the amount of space that he gives to it in the scriptures. For example, in John's Gospel, where we took our reading from today, John's Gospel has 21 chapters. And out of those 21 chapters, 8 of them, 8 out of 21, are about Passion Week. During that final week of his earthly ministry, Jesus was showing us how we should live every week. On Palm Sunday, Jesus came into the city determined to complete God's mission. On Holy Monday, Jesus was investing in God's house. On Holy Tuesday, he was patiently contending for lost souls. And then last week, Pastor Glenn brought a wonderful message about Holy Wednesday. And Jesus was showing us that day through the actions of Mary of Bethany how to lavish our love upon him like Mary did. She was intoxicated with Jesus and he approved of how she offered him her worship and her service. And church, there's something important for us to learn and to imitate in every one of those days. As the Lord says to us in our reading this morning, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And today we're talking about Holy Thursday, just one day before Christ offered himself for our sins. On that Thursday, Jesus gathered with his disciples for the Last Supper, and he instituted the celebration of Holy Communion, or the Lord's Supper. The other three Gospels tell us about that, tell us about the Lord's Supper, although John really doesn't so much. Instead, John focuses on how Jesus spent time teaching his disciples before going to the Garden of Gethsemane. John reveals how Jesus gave them his new commandment, which we read, and then taught his friends the most important things that they needed to know before he left this world. You can read about that in John chapters 14 through 17, which we refer to as Jesus' farewell discourse. Jesus talks to us there in those beautiful chapters about his father's house. He talks about remaining or abiding in him, and he teaches us about the Holy Spirit there. We also catch our greatest glimpse into Jesus' prayer life found in his wonderful high priestly prayer in John 17. <clears throat> In John's Gospel, we find all of those wonderful I am statements of our Lord where Jesus says things like, I am the bread of life, or I am the light of the world, or I am the resurrection and the life. But when you read chapters 13 through 17, I find that there's a powerful, unspoken I am statement that Jesus seems to be making to us, and it's this. It's as though when we read those chapters, the Lord is saying to us, I am your friend. The 19th century preacher Alexander McLaren said about those chapters, Nowhere else is Jesus' speech at the same time so simple and so deep. Nowhere else do we have the heart of God so unveiled to us. The immortal words which Christ spoke in that upper chamber are his highest self-revelation in speech, even as the cross is his most perfect self-revelation in act. Church, I hope that sometime before Easter, you'll take time to read those chapters for yourself and meditate upon the precious words of Jesus that are found there. Now, in every day of the Passion Week thus far, we have found something to embrace and to incorporate into our own lives. And looking at Holy Thursday, we find many wonderful things to imitate there also. 
You know, some may disagree, but I would suggest that our passage today contains some of the most important lessons for anyone who is a follower of Jesus Christ. Many of you know that 1 Corinthians 13 is the famous love chapter. But let me suggest to you that we could call John 13 the chapter of love in action. The Bible tells us that God is love. And here in John 13, Jesus Christ, God come in the flesh, was showing us that love in action. John begins chapter 13 by telling us that Jesus loved his own who were in the world and he loved them to the end. But you know, those words can also be translated to read that he loved them to the fullest extent. Isn't that beautiful? Others translate it by saying it like this. He showed them the fullest extent of his love. What amazing love of our Lord. Church, this is our challenge. And however mind-boggling it may be for us, this is Christ's command that we should love one another as he has loved us. Certainly, I know we can never duplicate the kind of love that Jesus showed upon the cross, and yet he commands us to love the way he does. How can we ever do that? How can we love as he does? Well, the upper room shows him teaching us how on the night he was betrayed. And this morning, I want to share with you four lessons on the love of Christ, four lessons that we can draw from Jesus' words and deeds there in the upper room. The first lesson is this, Jesus' love is a love that is expressed in humility. Jesus' love is expressed through humility. Verses 4 and 5 tell us Jesus rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. You know, in all the literature of the ancient world, all of it, no one ever demonstrated this kind of humility. At that time, it was common for a servant to wash the feet of an incoming house guest. But make no mistake, this was the job of a servant. One friend did not wash the feet of another friend, nor would you wash the feet of your peers, of your social equal. On rare occasions, a wife might wash her husband's feet, or a child perhaps might wash the feet of his father. And rabbis could ask their students to serve them in menial ways, but not to the extent of touching their feet. Church, remember that in Judea, as in many other places, of course, people wore open-toed sandals. So depending on the time of year there, the roads were either blanketed with dust or else they were covered in mud, depending. Obviously, there were animal droppings here and there. And in the built-up cities, even human waste might be thrown out into the street. For obvious reasons then, foot washing was looked down upon. It was the duty of a slave. In fact, foot washing was the mark of a slave. Jewish people did not even want their fellow Jews to have to do it. They did not want to subject even their Jewish servants to the indignity of having to do that. And so they sometimes would hire Gentile servants to wash people's feet instead. People not only despised the job, they despised the garments as well. Jewish people wore two garments, an outer robe and an inner robe. And to wash feet, you first had to take off your outer robe, possibly also the inner robe, just perhaps leaving yourself with a loincloth. And then you wrapped yourself in the towel, which was the emblem of service. To be dressed in a towel marked you out as a foot washer. It marked you out as someone who probably had very few useful skills, either in the kitchen or in the field. Church, I want to tell you this morning that in all of the literature that has come down to us from the Greek 
or the Roman or the Jewish sources, there is no record of a superior washing the feet of his inferior. And certainly it goes without saying, therefore, that no one could have ever imagined a God who would do so. And yet here is Jesus washing his disciples' feet. Jesus says, you call me teacher and Lord. And actually the Greek gets stronger. In the Greek it tells us that Jesus really said, you call me the teacher and you call me the Lord. And you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. What do we learn about Jesus' love? From this first we see, of course, that Jesus' love is a condescending love. This means that Jesus condescended or voluntarily lowered himself to serve us. We speak of it this way in our own language. In our language, right, we sometimes speak of things being beneath us. We say, well, I'm not going to do that in my position. That's beneath me. But here is Jesus laying aside his garments in order to wash people's feet. And I want to suggest to you, church, this morning that this is actually a picture of the humility that Christ had already shown merely to enter our world. And to see his condescending love in action, we first go not to the upper room or to Calvary, but we go to his heavenly throne and we see him taking off his blinding robe of glory. The Bible says that he clothes himself in light and he dwells in unapproachable light that no man can see. But Jesus laid aside that robe and he girded himself, as it were, with the towel of human flesh, becoming one of us. He didn't despise the thought of becoming tired or hungry as men do or sharing in many other experiences that never would have touched him if he had stayed where he rightly deserved to be. But out of his great love for you and for me, he humbly exchanged that glorious robe for the towel of his flesh. He had come to serve and not to be served. Here in the upper room, he lowers himself further. We see him taking off the robe of a rabbi that made him recognizable in the street and lent him dignity. Now he appeared as a servant, and he would even function as one too without being ashamed. The next morning, he would go lower still all the way down, and the prince of life would taste death. Just as he emptied himself to enter the world, just as he poured out water to wash feet, there at the cross he would also pour out his own blood to wash us clean. No wonder the old hymn says, Hallelujah, what a Savior. And as the Apostle Paul reflected on this, he marveled at the heart of Christ. He says in Philippians 2, though he was in the form of God, he didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being found in the likeness of men. And so being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And Paul goes on to say, because of that, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name. So so that at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow. We also learn from the upper room that Jesus' love is ready to serve. While it was the custom to wash the feet of guests, there was no slave there to greet the 13 men apparently that night in the upper room. And yet, look at Jesus. Jesus was ready to serve. He saw the opportunity to serve and he did so without being asked. Jesus inconvenienced himself to serve. Did you catch it in our text? He arose from supper and he gave up his own comfort. 
You may remember from the Gospels that Jesus would not leave or stop his own preaching even to satisfy the request of his own family. But to show love for his disciples, he would eat his dinner cold. Jesus gave up his opportunity for fellowship. That Thursday night became a sleepless night that would keep rolling forward through the night into the most horrific day of all. And yet by his loving choice, as he faced the cross in the next morning, there would be no me time for the master. Jesus prepared himself to serve also. He deliberately laid aside his dignity. He didn't think that serving was beneath him. Nor did he seek to serve in the spotlight only. He took on both the appearance and the duties of a slave. I also see that Jesus served church when others failed to. Do you notice in our text that we don't see any of the 12 stepping up to say, Jesus, fellow disciples, I will be your servant tonight. Do you see it, church? The disciples weren't even willing to do it for Jesus. Shockingly, Mary had cleaned his feet with her own hair, but his closest friends didn't even offer to fill him up a basin of water. I started to weep when I thought about it. What an opportunity each man there had. Each man there had a chance to be remembered the way that Mary was. We talk about John the Beloved, but imagine with me, church, if things had gone differently in the heart of one of those men that evening, perhaps we might also today have been talking about the apostle, maybe Philip or Nathaniel. We might have been talking about Philip who offered to wash the feet of Jesus. What a word that is for us, because you and I serve a master who says that if we even give a cup of cold water to someone because they're a follower of Christ, we will in no way lose our reward. I also see that Jesus' love was stronger than human pride. He did what others were too proud to do. Unbelievably, in the middle of all that was happening and everything that was about to come, the disciples had been arguing about who was the greatest. Luke tells us that Jesus responded to this by saying, Who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Isn't it he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you, Jesus said, as the one who serves. Jesus gave us his powerful example so that we should do this too. We cannot be above it and we are not above it because he was not above it. We, like Jesus, must take off the robe and get rid of every kind of false dignity or every kind of sense of superiority that would get in the way of our service. Following Christ's example, our deeds of service can't be things that we merely talk about or things we approve of or even praise. We must actually perform them lowering ourselves if necessary in order to imitate the one who stooped so low to raise us up. Four lessons about Jesus' love from the upper room. The first is that Jesus' love is expressed in humility. The second one is this. Jesus' love is a love that conquers hate. Jesus' love conquered hate. Church, the love of Jesus could not be overcome by people's opposition to him, nor even the betrayal of a trusted friend. Maybe you've never considered this before, but that evening, Jesus loved them all, and he washed all their feet. And that includes even Judas, who did not leave the meal to betray Jesus until later on. Imagine this, Jesus showed the same love and humility to his betrayer as he did to the faithful ones. Judas had a bag, but Jesus had a towel for him. Judas was going to sell him, but Jesus was still going to serve him. Even knowing what Judas would do, Jesus continued to walk in love towards him. And you know what, church? That kept the beautiful spirit of Jesus from being tainted. 
It kept his beautiful heart from receiving any root of bitterness. He ministered there in the most humble way to this man who thought that extravagant worship of Christ was a waste. And he kept ministering to him even though the poison of Judas was at work. Even though Judas was spreading around his critical spirit. You see, being swayed by Judas's pose, his pose of religiosity, the other disciples were starting to pick it up that last week, pick it up from him like the flu. Matthew tells us that it was not only Judas, but all of the 12 who criticized Mary for anointing Jesus. In Matthew 26, we read this, but when his disciples saw it, they were indignant saying, why this waste? But Jesus kept loving Judas, and all throughout that night, listen, Jesus gave him many opportunities to turn his heart away from his evil intentions, including there at the meal, at the table. Now, we've all seen paintings of the Last Supper, but to be honest, there are very few historical scenes that have been painted so completely wrong uh, so many times. Uh, we know that there was no Cassone's bread on the table, right? We know that. <laughs> but more importantly, no one was using a chair, with apologies to Leonardo. You see, the Jews, at least for special occasions, had borrowed the Greek custom of reclining on couches arranged around a center serving table, like you see in the painting there, typically laid out in the shape of the letter U. This was called the triclinium, and that word means the three-couch arrangement. So at each couch, there might be three or four people lying there so that you could have 10 or 12 people dining together. If you were invited to dinner, you would lay on a couch or you would lay on pillows and you would be facing the food that was being served on a table in the middle. Your feet then were pointing towards the outside of the room. And you know what that did? That made it actually easy for a slave to work her way around the outside area of the perimeter of the room and wash your feet. Remember what I said about Jesus not serving in the spotlight. He had to work his way around the back of the table to wash the feet of his friends. Now, this meant that as you lay at the table, you would lie on your left side. So I, their gastroenterologist would probably have approved. <laughs> See, God is smart. Amen? And because most people are right-handed church, they would then use their right hand to eat. Of course, this meant that unlike the way that we eat at table, you did not turn your face to speak to the person next to you like, like we do for the simple reason that you were not sitting alongside them. You were actually facing the back of the person who was next to you. So if you wanted to speak to someone, you would have to lean back and look up into their face. You've read in the Gospels how John was lying in Jesus' bosom. And so this is how John was speaking to Jesus because John was laying up on Jesus' bosom. If he wanted to speak to Jesus, he would have to lean back a little bit, tilt up his head, and look into the face of Jesus. Now, obviously, this is a lot more physical closeness than men in our culture might be comfortable with. But for them, it was normal. And the way that this was done in Roman and Mediterranean society, Jesus would have been seated in the middle of the first table there on the left, as you see in this painting. In the Roman world, that's where the host family sat at that first table. So in other words, if you start from the bottom left, John is at the end and Jesus is the next one in. So yes, John was literally eating with his head up against Jesus' chest. And John's position, according to their custom, was the position of the trusted friend of the host. And notice with me, though, also, <clears throat> that Jesus handed Judas the sop, which was usually a piece of bread uh, wrapped together with some meat, maybe some other food, and dipped in sauce. So if you're thinking about this with me, uh, you've already figured it out. If you like soft-shell tacos you would have done very well in the first century, all right? 
But to be handed food like this was probably a mark of courtesy and honor. So anyone who is watching this scene taking place would immediately draw the conclusion that Jesus and Judas were very good friends. But in fact, it was even more than that. The fact that Jesus could easily hand food to Judas could only mean one thing. It meant that Judas was on Jesus' left hand. And church, believe it or not, the way that this was done in Mediterranean culture, that was the position of the guest of honor. So that diagram is actually a good approximation of where the men were situated. The artist here is actually speculating a little as to where Peter was sitting, but with good reason, because remember that Peter motioned over at John to try to get John to ask Jesus who Jesus is talking about. And in the Greek, the word that is used there means that Peter gestured with his head or his eyebrows, just like we do. So Peter evidently is a cross or somewhere where he can catch John's eye and go like this, ask him, ask him. That's really what was happening there. Sounds like Peter, right? So church, listen, get the scene with me. If we are part of this culture and we don't know anyone at this dinner and we walk into the room, anyone who comes into the room that night could have told from a single glance that Christ was the host, John was his best friend, and Judas, though, was the guest of honor. Now listen, church, this tells us that even to the very end, Jesus was still reaching out and showing love to this man whom he knew to be a thief and a betrayer. Remarkably, the beautiful heart of our Lord, he even safeguarded Judas at the table. He knew what Judas was about, but he did not expose him to the group as a whole, only to John. In fact, when Judas left, we read about how everybody thought that Judas had gone out on some noble errand. You know, there was no greater breaking of protocol in the ancient world than to betray someone who had shared your meal. Jesus quotes King David's prophecy saying, He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. If you've ever wondered what that means, that's actually a picture that comes from farming life. And it describes how an animal might raise himself up high and kick at you, kick at your back. Judas would indeed kick at Jesus like that after eating Jesus' bread. In our culture, we would say he stabbed him in the back. And in fact, Judas did eat that meal that night lying up against the back of Jesus, the place of trust. More poignantly... Jesus, in his humility and love, had just washed the feet of Judas, and in so doing, he also washed Judas's treacherous heel. What amazing love of Christ. And Jesus safeguarded his own heart against bitterness by continuing to love Judas. Jesus warns us also in the Gospels that in the last days, because of iniquity, because of sins that are committed, that we see or that are done to us, the love of many, Jesus said, would grow cold. The antidote for this, Jesus shows us, is to continue to walk in love toward those who harm us, who hate us, or even betray us, imitating Christ himself. We're sharing four lessons about Jesus' love from the upper room. His love is expressed in humility. Number two, it's a love that conquers hate. And number three, Jesus' love is a love that bears with human weakness. His love bears with human weakness. In Jesus' dealings with Peter, we don't have a lot of time to go into it in detail. I wish we did. But <clears throat> Jesus' dealings with Peter show us how he patiently bears with the follies of our humanity. See, there's a sense here in which Peter thought he was wiser than God, wiser than Christ. He thought he understood his own needs better than Jesus. He said, oh, no, Lord, don't do that. That's not what I need. Lord, that's not your place to do that. And friends, I can't help but wondering how many times Christ comes to us with an offer of help. And yet in our pride, we tell Jesus, it's not really what we need. Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. And yet we refuse to receive from him. We don't even really understand our needs from God's point of view. And yet we're bold enough to reject his assessment of what I need in my life. 
and still he patiently bears with me. Jesus served the ignorant. In other words, his love drove him to bear with those who didn't yet understand his mission or understand his actions. When Jesus says that you don't know what I'm doing, but later on, Peter, you'll know. It's actually two different words in the Greek. And what Jesus was saying to Peter was, you don't yet know what I'm doing, but you will learn about it later on through experience. See, instead of giving up on us in our childishness, Jesus lovingly, lovingly steps into my stubbornness and into my short-sightedness to correct me and teach me like he did for Peter until I learn a little bit more. Church, how we should thank God for that patient love of Christ for his people. Are you glad that he's patient with you today? See, there in that upper room, Jesus was tenderly and patiently ministering to imperfect believers and is still the same today. Let's all be very glad for that. John says he loved those who were his own in the world, and thank God he still does. He will forever love his own, and he will always show them the fullest extent of his love. He, it says, who began a good work in you, will continue performing that work until the day he comes in glory. That's what Jesus' love is like. It's a love that bears with our human frailties and our weaknesses. And the application for us is obvious. I will simply say that we must do likewise and be lovingly patient with those who push back at us or who simply don't quite get yet what it is that we're trying to convey to them. That was the way of Christ the example. The final lesson we need to take away from the upper room about Jesus' love may be the most important lesson of all. And it's this number four. Jesus' love is a love that comes from heaven. It's a love that comes from heaven. When we study Jesus' love, we quickly understand that his love surpasses any love that you and I can imagine. But here in John 13, Jesus is giving us what he calls his new commandment. A new commandment, he says, I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, to be sure, this was a new commandment, Jesus says so, but it sprang out of one that was already well known. And maybe you catch it there. It's the commandment to love our neighbor. Do you remember reading how when Jesus was asked what was the greatest commandment, Jesus replied, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and soul and all your mind. Jesus said that is the first and great commandment. And the second one next to it, Jesus said, is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So the command to love your neighbor wasn't new at all. But what made the new commandment so new was the standard of love. It was hard enough, if we're being honest with ourselves, it can be hard enough to love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves. But now here was Jesus elevating the standard and telling us that we must love the way that he has loved us. How does Jesus love us? Well, he loves us in all the ways we've been talking about this morning and then some. He loves me with that beautiful godly humility. He loves with a forgiving love. He loves with a love that's patient with my human weakness. And he loves me so much that he was willing to lay down his own life to save us and bring us home to the Father. That is the sacrificial love with which Christ commands us to love. Not just to love our neighbor as ourselves, but to love him more than we love ourselves. That love is real, and that love enabled Stephen to forgive his own killers, just like Jesus did. Men, that love is the command to every husband to love his wife as Christ loved the church. His love is the agape love that the Bible says suffers long and is kind, does not envy, does not parade itself, and is not puffed up. It's the love that Paul spoke about when he said, through love, serve one another. 
It's the love of Christ that Paul also prayed you and I would experience so that when we did experience it, we would be filled up to all the fullness of God. And yet, church, we know ourselves. We know what we're made out of. How can weak creatures like us possibly love like Jesus loves? How can we obey a command from God to love the way God loves? Could we do it by our own efforts? Never. Church, a command to love the way that God loves can only be obeyed with God's own love. Did you get that? Let me say it again because I need to hear it again. Listen, a command to love the way God loves could only be obeyed with God's own love. It will take God's love within us. And our sinful humanity can never love that way. In fact, Jesus said that to do it, a new birth is required. And we would need to have a new nature, different from the nature that we all know so well. We would need to receive a new nature that by nature loves the way that Jesus loves. The law of Moses can't ever help me do that, nor can any other legislation. There's no human effort. There's no morality that can help me to live right or to walk in that kind of love. Church, this is why we need the gospel. This is why we need the grace of God. You see, morality and the law may praise the love of God, but they can never produce the love of God. And that's why Jesus said, don't be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. See, when we come to Jesus and when we believe on him, we receive a new birth and we receive his nature. The Holy Spirit inside us then begins to produce the fruit within us of love and joy and peace and all of the other beautiful characteristics, all of the precious personality traits of the Lord Jesus inside of our hearts. So only those who belong to Christ can walk in the love of Christ. He washed their feet and he went to the cross and those were powerful examples. But even those powerful examples, as much as I need them, as much as I need to study those examples, those examples cannot give me the power to love like he does. John the Baptist did not say, behold the example. He said, behold the lamb. And we need the saving and sanctifying power of his cleansing blood. Thank God, church, if you do belong to Christ, the Bible says you won't be disappointed in these things because the Holy Spirit is pouring out the love of God in your heart on a daily basis, day by day by day. He's pouring out his love within you. If we don't know him, if we've never been born again, then of course that kind of life is impossible. But for the Christian, I'm here to tell you it's natural. So much so that when we fail to walk in that love, we feel the sting of it inside our hearts. Jesus said, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You know that every student, when he was fully trained, people could tell what kind of rabbi it was or maybe even who the particular rabbi was that he had studied under because they all had their particular teachings their particular ways of doing things so when you read that verse from now on I want you to read it and hear it like this in your head by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another because that was to be the distinguishing mark of being a follower of Rabbi Jesus as opposed to anyone else. Having the God kind of love, Jesus says, inside of our hearts will make the church be what Christ desires her to be. It will be the most powerful evidence to the world that our God is alive and real. Such a love doesn't come from this earth. It's not native to this earth, but it is native to heaven and it can only come from heaven. The love that comes from heaven, the love and grace and truth that Jesus brought from heaven, that love will enable us to live like he lived and love like he loved. 
Church, let us seek to know his love and walk in it so that we can obey his new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. Let's learn how Jesus loves. Come on, stand together with me. Let's give Jesus a hand of praise in his house today. Thank you, Lord.